seasoned by countless border clashes with the Dornish and the recent victorious campaign against the Vulture King, Lord Boris Baratheon wasted no time in restoring order to King's Landing. After a night of quiet celebration in the Red Keep, he rode forth against Visenya Hill and the Cunny King, Gaiman Pelhair. Columns of armoured knights climbed the hill from three directions. Riding down the street scum, sellswords and drunkards who had gathered round the little king, putting them to rout. The young monarch, who had celebrated his fifth name day only two days previous, was carried back to the Red Keep, slung over the back of a horse, chained and weeping. His mother walked behind him, clutching the hand of the Dornish woman, Sylvania Sand, and leading a long column of whores, witch women, cut purses, sneaks and sots, the surviving remnants of the pale hare's court. The shepherd's turn came the next night, forewarned by the fate of the whores and their little king, the prophet, had called upon his barefoot army to assemble around the dragon pit and defend the Hilaranes with blood and iron, but the shepherd's star had fallen. Fewer than 300 came in answer to his call, and many of those fled when the assault began. Lord Boris led his knights up the hill from the west, while Sir Perkin and his gutter knights climbed the steeper slopes to the south from Flea Bottom, crashing through the thin ranks of the defenders in the ruins of the dragon pit. They found the prophet amongst the dragon heads, now far gone in rot, surrounded by a ring of torches, still preaching doom and devastation, when he spied Lord Boris on his war horse. The shepherd pointed his stump at him and cursed, We shall meet in hell before the year is done, the begging brother proclaimed. Like game and pale hair, he was taken alive and carried back to the Red Keep, bound in chains. Thus did peace return to King's Landing, after a fashion, in the name of her son, our true king Aegon, second of his name, Queen Alicent proclaimed a curfew, making it unlawful to be on the city streets after dark. The city watch was reformed under the command of Sir Perkin to enforce the curfew, while Lord Boris and his Stormlanders manned the city gates and battlements. Pulled down from their three hills, the three false kings languished in the dungeons, awaiting the true king's return. That return hinged upon the Valarians of Driftmark, however. Behind the walls of the Red Keep, the Dowager Queen Alicent and Laris Strong had offered the Sea Snakers freedom, a full pardon for his treasons, and a place on the King's small council if he would bend his knee to Aegon II as his king and deliver them the swords and sails of Driftmark. The old man had proved to be surprisingly intractable, however. My knees are old and stiff and do not bend easily, Lord Corliss responded, before settling forth terms of his own. He ordered pardons not only for himself, but for all those who had fought for Queen Rhaenyra, and demanded further that Aegon the Younger be given Princess Jahera's hand in marriage, so the two of them might jointly be proclaimed King Aegon's heirs. The realm has been split asunder, he said. We must need to join it back together. One of Lord Baratheon's daughters did not interest him, but he wanted Lady Baylor freed at once. Queen Alicent was outraged by Lord Valerian's arrogance. Munkin tells us, especially his demand that Queen Rhaenyra's son, Aegon, be named as heir to her own Aegon. She had suffered the loss of two of her three sons and her only daughter during the dance. They could not bear that the thought of any of her rival's sons should live. Angrily, her grace reminded Lord Corliss that she had twice proposed terms of peace to Rhaenyra, only to have her overtures rejected with scorn. It fell to Lord Laris the clubfoot to pour oil on the troubled waters calming the queen with a quiet reminder of all they had discussed in Lord Baratheon's tent, and persuading her to consent to the Sea Snake's proposals. The next day, Lord Corliss Valerian, the Sea Snake, knelt before Queen Alicent as she sat upon the lower steps of the Iron Throne as a proxy for her son, and there pledged the king his loyalty and that of his house. Before the eyes of gods and men, the Dowager Queen granted him and his a royal pardon and restored him to his old place on the small council as admiral and master of ships. Ravens went forth to Driftmark and Dragonstone to announce the accord, and not a day too soon, for they found young Alan Bellarion gathering his ships for an attack on Dragonstone, and King Aegon II preparing once again to behead his cousin Baylor.